25% of young children around the world are not getting enough nutrients to grow properly. That's according to a new report that lays bare the effects on the most vulnerable of the global food crisis. What or who is responsible for this tragedy? And what would it take to save a starving generation? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. 300 children are dying of malnutrition each hour, according to a new report released by the Save the Children Aid Agency. That's a total of 2.6 million children each year. The report, entitled A Life Free from Hunger, also states that the growth and development of one in four of the world's children is stunted by malnutrition. Perhaps the most disturbing part of the report is that there are numerous viable solutions to this crisis that are not being exercised because of failed public policy and chronic underinvestment. One of the countries surveyed in the report is India, and the Prime Minister there describes chronic malnutrition as the country's greatest shame. Prerna Suri travelled to Madhya Pradesh state to find out just why so many children are malnourished. Suhail should weigh about six kilos for his age. But at a paltry three kilos, he's a fraction of what he should be. According to the World Bank, he's among 16 million children in India who are severely malnourished. Like Suhail, all the children at this local clinic are underweight. Their mothers are too weak and too poor to give them enough food. Kulsum knows her little boy needs proper nutrients to grow up. But she tells us there's little she can do about it. There's only one of us earning money in the family. It's not enough to bring up our child, and there have been days when he's gone hungry. It's a dilemma faced by thousands of mothers in the state of Madhya Pradesh. Over 78,000 children are malnourished here. And here, deep inside rural Madhya Pradesh, the problem is at its worst. This district has had one of the highest number of malnutrition deaths, and we can see why. Families are too poor, many can't afford to feed their children. Some, like Sampath, live off the handouts of her neighbours since her husband died. She lost her son to malnutrition, but she's determined to keep her two daughters alive. I'll borrow money from work or take loans from other people, just so that my two girls can be saved. But one mother's determination isn't enough. Activists say what's needed is more health centers in these villages. Those that are set up are too far away. And many like this one simply don't function as there aren't any doctors. This is a government-run nutrition center for treatment of malnourished children. It's one of the few ones for around this area. But as you can see, there aren't any doctors, any children, and there's definitely no treatment happening here. So beds like these, which could possibly save lives, are just lying empty. It's an issue which activists say the government needs to take seriously. We've never given it the seriousness it deserves. So I think it's a lack of political will across the political spectrum, cutting across party lines, because, uh, you know, the truth is that children dying doesn't make news in India. The Prime Minister has called malnutrition India's national shame, and he's promised to help. But each day, more underfed children are admitted to hospitals. And if that promise isn't kept, for many it will be too late. Pradna Suryal Jazeera, Madhya Pradesh. So what are the solutions for tackling child malnutrition? And what is at stake for the world's children if the crisis continues? To answer these questions and more, we are joined by our guests. In London, we have Brendan Cox, Director of Policy and Advocacy at Save the Children. Also in London, Professor Richard Tiffin, director at the Center for Food Security at the University of Reading. And in Nairobi, Wilfred Nyangena, professor of environmental economics at the University of Nairobi. Thank you all for joining us. To begin with, Richard Tiffin, malnutrition appears to be in many ways a hidden crisis. Is this part of the problem, do you believe? Yes, I think there's very much so. And I think the report that we're here to talk about today is to be applauded for putting malnutrition right at the very heart of the debate. I think for some time we've been aware that food security is of importance, 
but perhaps the emphasis in discussing food security has been very heavily on are we able to produce enough food, are the calories that we're going to produce in the world going to be sufficient to feed the growing population of the world. When actually meeting the calorific demands of the population is only part of the problem. Ensuring that those calories are in foods that are of a sufficiently high quality to ensure that people are adequately uh, nourished and that their nutrition is, is good is, is actually as important if not more important and it's receiving very little attention at the moment. Brendan Cox, why the timing of this report? Why is it being issued at this specific time? I think there's two things. I think there's both a threat and, a, and an opportunity which mean that now is a moment to really focus on this. Firstly, on the threat side, we've seen in 2011 food prices uh, reach uh, a new record high after a series of records high in, back in 2008, another record high. Um, so we're very worried about the impact of that. The impact of that we won't be entirely clear on um, until later on down the line. The way that malnutrition works is that you don't really understand the full impact for a couple of years because that's how long it tends to uh, take to impact on the system. So there's, there's that threat and something that we're very worried about. But then on the opportunity side, we do get a sense that this year, 2012 and into 2013, there is an opportunity to put both food security more generally and nutrition specifically at the heart of the international agenda. We've got the US G G8 coming up um, in Chicago. Uh, in summer this year, which is going to focus on uh, food security, nutrition and agriculture. We know that the Mexicans have it on their agenda for the G20 and we're hoping the UK government will put it on their agenda uh, both around the Olympics when there's uh, many heads of state convening in the UK but also for the UK G8 uh, in 2013. So there's a sense that actually at long last these issues are starting to get the attention that they deserve. I agree with Richard this has been a, a hidden crisis for too long but there is an opportunity. We know what works and what we need now is the political will and then the investment backing that up to make the difference. Well let's just make one thing very clear here and this I think is important in this discussion that families in developing countries we hear in the report spend some 50 to 80 percent of the income on food, whereas the average UK family, for example, spends some 8 percent. Now, Wilfred Nyangena in Nairobi, clearly we see at the very outset here that there is a geographical issue contained in this as well. It is the developing countries that bear the impact of malnutrition. Well, absolutely true. I mean, uh, look at the way African countries uh, define food security. They define it in terms of maize. And maize is um, full of starch, but uh, lacking essential uh, nutritional elements and so on. So it's quite uh, in order that uh, this report has come at this time and highlighting such an important issue, which has been uh, hidden for a long, long time. I quite agree with that. Is there perhaps an element, um, yeah. Richard Tiffin, that because it is the developing countries rather than the major industrialized ones in which malnutrition is a major issue that the world as a whole the G8 the G20 who we are referring to have been slow in terms of reacting in a universal basis yes I think that's right I think the emphasis in uh, in the developed world has, has, has been on, on, on too much food in fact if we think about the the European Union and the, the, the debates around the common agricultural policy not so long ago we were worrying about wine lakes and cereal mountains and and, uh, 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 and milk lakes and, and, and they were really just an artifact of a very distorted system but nonetheless in political terms that, that, was, that was the reality that faced, that, that faced us, that, uh, that we had enough food and we didn't need to worry about agriculture and there were a lot more important things for, for economic growth that were, that were, that were higher, much higher up the agenda. So I think that's right, I think, I think agriculture and, and, and food production more generally has been neglected both at a political level but also in terms of research and development and, and development of new technologies for, for a long, long time. Well, uh, Wilfred, again, I just want to get back to you on this particular issue. The issue may not necessarily be that there is not enough food. It is about the quality of the food and it is about getting the food to the bulk of the people, in particular the children who are so vulnerable. Is that correct, do you believe? I, I don't think so. I mean, uh, look at most African countries as we speak now. There is a shortage of that uh, basic grain that they define no, food culture has been uh, defined as a shortage of maize or corn, as it were. And that, with restricted border trade within many African countries because of conflict and several other reasons, it doesn't even get there. Yeah? And then the other thing is that um, 
it's not really enough. I mean, a lot of these countries put in efforts year in, year out, which don't seem to bear lots of uh, fruit in terms of ensuring food security. And we are talking about very, very poor people that uh, hardly have any monies or any income to afford alternatives and so on. So it's really, really serious issue, not just food availability, but is that shortage of food also to get it across to the various households and so on. And the child ends up uh, suffering. You talk of milk, they, 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 there's not enough milk to supplement uh, the, the corn and, or the maize, as it were. Uh, you're talking of uh, meat. Meat uh, is a very rare commodity. You know, it um, goes uh, hand in hand with uh, drought and uh, the subsequent shortage of grain, as it were. So it's not abundant food, but there's total lack of it. Well, Brendan Cox, total we lack. will talk in, in a moment about what can be done, but I'd also like to just uh, broaden the discussion as a report does. We're not just talking about fatalities. We are talking about the stunting of children's growth. We are mm. talking about millions upon millions of children who will have less chances, less ability, will be less uh, powerful economic earners for, for, for a fact. Will you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's something that we often don't think about. I think we um, are used to seeing pictures of emergency situations where, uh, where children are severely wasted. Um, uh, and that means that their, their muscles have started to waste, uh, generally due to a lack of, of, of calories. Um, we're then less used to talking about this underlying malnutrition where children are too small uh, for, their, for their age, where they haven't had the minerals and vitamins that they've needed to develop properly. And that's got an impact, as you touched on, both on their, um, their brain development, on their physical development. They'll be more susceptible to diseases, less likely to do well at school. So this is something that has an impact right across their lives. And the issue is, uh, with this condition, which is called stunting, um, is that in, if that happens in the first two years of your life, it's very, very difficult to uh, repair and reverse that. It tends to be irreparable in most of these situations. So you have this thousand day window from conception until essentially your second birthday when we can focus efforts, when we can focus those def efforts down on that key window. If we do that, we know we can have a transformative impact. And we also know that countries have done that. I think th th this is one of the things that we're trying to do today, both to talk about the impact on child mortality, and we estimate around 2.6 million children die each year with malnutrition as an underlying factor. But we also think that almost 200 million people, between 170, 190 million children, are what we call stunted. That means one in three children in the developing world and one in four children globally are stunted. That has a massive impact across our economies. And the fact that we haven't taken this seriously uh, enough, I think, is an indictment of our prioritization. Until we do that, we're wasting human potential, but we're also causing human misery. Well, the Save the Children report suggests a number of solutions, including direct nutrition intervention and fortification of staple foods. The World Bank estimates that it would cost just $1 per person per year to greatly improve the lives of more than 4 billion people. This amount could play a major role in keeping families above the poverty line. The report also suggests improving the global food system, investing primarily in local small-scale farmers and particularly women who comprise some 50% of this marginalised sector. Other ideas suggested by experts elsewhere include urban food production, such as growing food on rooftops and public lands, genetic engineering, which promises to increase crop yields per unit area of farmland, and also enable crops to grow in conditions unsuitable for normal crop varieties. True land reform, to put good quality land in the hands of those who would sow it, rather than those who can afford to buy it. But that issue of social protection, Brazil has notably shown that assistance in the form of grants to families not only lowers malnutrition, but stimulates economic growth. Richard Tiffin, is this a template that should be followed? Yes, I think that's right. I think uh, some of the uh, earlier remarks that we made by my two colleagues have pointed to the importance of agriculture, not just as a provider of food, of, not, uh, of sufficient food for us to eat, it's also very important in generating the economic access to food as well. So as, as agriculture grows, it generates incomes and, and it enables people to, who, are, who, are, who are stuck in a poverty trap to, to afford the kinds of food, the food that they need for, 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 their adequate, for adequate nutrition. 
and we've also talked about uh, the, the importance of women in that, in that process as well and actually empowering women to, to, uh, to, to, to make the kinds of food choices that are important for their families has also been shown to be very, very important in, in, in delivering food security for, for children. So I think, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I think that it's, n it's not just agriculture as a, as a provider of food, it's a, as an agriculture as an engine for growth in, in, in the economy. I mean, one word of, one word of caution that I, that I might add to that is that I think that there is a danger that we, we place misplaced emphasis on, on, on smallholder agricultural production. For the reasons that I've just said, it, that is very, very important. But as we, as we move forward into the 21st century, those populations are going to become much more heavily urbanised than they are than they are now, and in that respect, I think we have to start to think about solutions that move move the the smallholder sector into a larger a larger a larger farming sector, uh, in the same way that, that that agriculture has developed in other parts of the world. Well, well Wilfred Youngena, would you like to pick up on that particular issue? First of all, the importance of the small farmers, but secondly, also that development within the small farming uh, industry. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, one, it is an important initiative if it uh, takes place, but uh, a word of caution. Yeah, small scale, we have 80% in most African uh, countries dependent on agriculture. So it is good that they get some empowerment and grow their agriculture to get the incomes, as we mentioned. Two, the women element, that is good since uh, about 75% of uh, women are in directly engaged in agriculture. But uh, defining something like a silver bullet for all may not necessarily fit the bill. It will be important to undertake research in, uh, say, country-specific uh, contexts so as to alleviate uh, part of that problem. And also, we've seen a lot of other initiatives that are looking at food. Uh, it would not be nice just to overlook those but try and complement those. I want to mention the idea of diversifying a lot of the foods that are eaten in many parts of Africa. The Melinda Bill Gates Foundation looking at alternative foods like uh, millet and uh, probably potatoes and uh, so on. If those were fortified alongside uh, the upcoming initiatives, that would be, go a long way in uh, helping alleviate that malnutrition problem amongst uh, children. Well, let's just go to that particular point you made there and put it to Brendan Cox. You speak there that there is no silver bullet, uh, that you are looking perhaps at uh, approaching it on country-specific issues. Brendan Cox, how do you go about it? You want this kind of universal will, but how does one then move to implementation once you have got agreement on what needs to be done? Mm. I, know, I think that's exactly right, and what the report today uh, talks about is is several areas of focus. There is certainly no silver bullet. There's no panacea to this, uh, and if we think there is, then uh, then I think we're mistaken. So absolutely, that's one of the reasons we talk about these direct interventions. Is this package of direct interventions, everything from breastfeeding to fortification of food, um, which would make a real difference, and uh, we think if funded properly, could save around two million children's lives. There's then the social protection angle, which is uh, can be quite small cash transfers to uh, people and families. Uh, both to help them afford food and actually go out and buy that food where they can't do that, but also to act as a stimulus for investment so they can actually invest some of that food, uh, sorry, some of that money in improving their land, in some of the inputs that they might need. But it's also um, about agricultural policy and the policy of the government, um, some of the diversification that my colleague was just talking about, but also some of the investment that's needed in which for a very long time things like extension workers has been underinvested in. So there's all of those areas. What we're saying is two things are really needed. Firstly, the political prioritisation. There hasn't traditionally been uh, certainly over the last 20 years, the political prioritisation of this issue. As we were saying earlier, uh, we were used to having too much food and we were not prioritising this as a result. The amount of aid, for example, but also the amount of national investment that went into uh, food, agriculture and nutrition has plummeted. We're beginning to see some of that recover. There's a big opportunity there, but the first thing that's needed is that political prioritisation. The second thing that's needed is a clear plan, and that needs to be multi-sectoral. What that means is it needs to talk to the agriculture policy, it needs to talk to the food policy, it needs to talk to the health policy. One of the problems that we've had is that nutrition 
and malnutrition haven't sat neatly within one government department. There hasn't been any one person's responsibility. So presidents, we want both presidents and prime ministers to say who is it within their government that is going to lead on an overarching strategy, linking food security, linking nutrition. If we do that, we think we can make breakthroughs. Brazil's done it, uh, Bangladesh have done it. Many countries have made real progress. Again, it will be country specific, but what is needed is a plan and then resources to implement that plan. But one must also utter that word of caution. We do know that in 2008, for example, the, the Lancet report suggested 13 direct interventions, very simple, very low cost. Richard Tiffin, some seven years after that particular report, which suggested adding iodine to diets, very, very simple, specific things in various countries. That has not been acted upon to any great degree. Why should it be acted upon in a united way now, do you believe? Well, I mean, I think the reason why it should be enacted on is because uh, millions of children are dying as a result of malnutrition. But the reason why it isn't happening is for the reasons that uh, have just been talked about, that the, the, the lack of political will and the, and the, and the failing of the institutional structures within, within countries to, that, that, that just simply mean that, that this, this very, very important issue has just fallen through the cracks. It's not, it's not receiving the, the, the attention and the coverage that it's, that it's, that it's, that it's deserved, really. Um, and as you say, the, the, the solutions are very simple. We don't need uh, a massive investments. And I mean, I think the example of malaria, the strides that have been taken in, 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 in reducing the incidence of malaria are a very good example of what putting something right at the very heart of, a, of, of, of international conversations can achieve. And I, and I sincerely hope that this report leads to the same sort of uh, progress on, on malnutrition as we've seen on, on malaria. Well, Wilfred Nyangeno, who, who do you think in the end must bear responsibility for getting this moving? Is it international organisations or is it perhaps local governments or is it a mixture of all of these factors? Where do you think the implementation of these very simple measures and cost-effective measures should begin and should be directed from? Yeah, well, I think the largest responsibility lies with governments and uh, a mix of them actually because they complement each other. The synergies that uh, can be exploited out of such uh, an initiative will be enormous if uh, all organizations or institutions that are involved work together because of their various competencies and so on. So it's a mix uh, of all these, but the largest responsibility essentially lies with governments to implement it and uh, put it as part of the uh, major policy agenda. Yeah. Brendan Cox, uh, very briefly, do you think that the will is there that hasn't been before? Do you think that this 2012 is the opportune moment to strike, to get a universal agreement on this? Absolutely. I mean, again, we shouldn't think that in 2012 we will solve all of this, that everything will be concluded by the end of this year. But is there, is there an opportunity for a breakthrough? Absolutely. Do we think we can make a, a, a giant leap on this and really take a, a, a major step forward in the right direction, harnessing political will, harnessing resources behind this problem? Absolutely. We haven't had... Um, such an opportunity as, the, as this, I think, in many years. The rise in food price crises, um, the, uh, the rise in uh, the impact of that, for example, uh, underlying some of the uh, social protests means that this is much more front and centre of people's political agenda. We need to link that up with nutrition. 2012 is a great opportunity to do that. We won't solve everything, but absolutely we can make a major breakthrough. Richard Tiffin, very briefly, do you think that this is the right time and it can work? Yes, I do. And I don't know if I could come just come back briefly to the point about who's responsible for it. I think very often we've thought about development policy in the West, we've thought about it as a, in, a, in a sort of benevolent way. We, we, we'll send some food aid or we'll send some money to help solve this problem. And I think what we're starting to see now, and I think this is invaluable in solving this problem, is the starting to think of development policy much more as a partnership between governments in the developed and the, and the developing world. So I'm very optimistic that some of the things that we're seeing now are, 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 are likely to lead to significant progress in this area. Well, and a crisis it is indeed. And just a reminder that during the 30 minutes of this program, 150 children have died of malnutrition. My thanks to our guests in London, Brendan Cox and Richard Tiffin, and in Nairobi, Wilfred Nyangena. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. If you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.